This is a partner showcase. Uh, so our intent is a little different than in some of our other Access Academy webinars. So we're collaborating with and introducing you to our partners. In this case, one that you may not be as familiar with or maybe didn't think you were as familiar with. We're letting, giving you insights into solutions for the classroom, for the home. It really does uh, blend over in, in this particular case. We're sharing information on quota and non-quota solutions. So uh, there's a handout that's gonna be put in the chat that talks about the quota products that we sell at APH. And there also will be ones that you'll hear about today that are non-APH. The focus of a lot of our material today are quota products, but just be aware that there are also plenty of other solutions offered by Playability that are not on quota. And the handout should make that clear. And the focus of what we're talking about should make that clear as well. We'll be really featuring the quota products today, but just understand there are others that are not on quota that are available from Playability. As you may have already gathered, uh, there is no ACVREP credit for this webinar today. It's a one hour presentation with questions throughout. Please place those questions in the chat as you think of them. Closed captioning is available as well. We have three folks joining us today. Uh, Joyce Lopez, who you just heard from with Trivia, product developer for Playability Toys is with us. Also, Dr. Marty Fox, president from Playability Toys, is joining us. And from APH, Tristan Pierce, who's a multiple disabilities and physical education product manager, is joining us as well. So they'll all be presenting today. Let's talk about some challenges. It can definitely be hard to find toys that fit these descriptions that we've got here that meet meet children's different learning styles and abilities, uh, ones that are accessible and safe for children of all different abilities, ones that promote physical and intellectual stimulation for all children, age and developmentally level appropriate. And you know it can be difficult to match toys to individual abilities of a child. Uh, we, we look at toys and think, well, everybody can play with this toy. And that's not always the case. And it can be create, tough to create lesson plans and physical activities that take advantage of toy features while also recognizing different abilities of each child. So uh, we're gonna learn a lot more about those things today. And I'm gonna hand this off to Joyce to get us started. Okay, hello, uh, my name is Joyce Lopez and I wanna thank everyone for this webinar. We're very honored to, to be here with you. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how the company was started. Um, back in 2003, Bill Bridge and Bud Fraze, Bill Bridge was one of the first 100 employees at Oracle and Bud Fraze was an aeronautical engineer. They brought a toy to the little company I was working for in Berkeley, California. And it just so happened to be a prototype of the rivet ball. And it was very interesting. Um, I've never, I had never seen a ball like this, but what was more interesting was how the ball came about. Bud Fraze did tandem cycling for the blind. And through this organization, he somehow got in contact with Jacob, who was born without eyes, with his mother. And his mother wanted Bud to create a toy that was lightweight, easy to grab, easy to throw, would not roll away. Of course, balls roll away, so it, it really does stay within reach and made noise, but had no batteries. So Bud, being the engineer that he is, came up with the rivet ball. And it, it is a very amazing, simple but amazing toy. After that, um, someone saw the ball. He was invited to the Helen Keller School for the Blind and Deaf in New York. Of course, the ribbit ball was part of this visit. And 
the teacher took him to a room that was filled with kids. And she asked Bud to toss the ball into this room. Well, Bud was so amazed because these kids just were able to track the ball with the simple little crinkle noise that it made when it hit the ground. So this got Bud so excited. I ended up joining the company in 2003. Bill Bridge wanted to make mainstream toys. It was actually his company. He started it and wanted Bud to run it. I joined them, but I, I was raised by a mom who was deaf and Bud had a special connection to the special needs world as well. So we knew what direction we wanted to take the company. And um, we were invited to the Marvin Piccolo School for the Disabled in Nevada, Reno, Nevada, Bud and I were. And we were able to observe the students and their interaction with the teachers and therapists. And we were able to come up with some simple but effective toys for kids with special needs. After a couple of years, it was 2006, I thought, okay, it's time, let's, let's try taking our few products to New York Toy Fair. And New York Toy Fair, if anyone's not familiar, is massive. There, it's overwhelming. I'll, I'll say it's just overwhelming. And here, this little Bill and Bud ink with a spattering of toys. And I wasn't sure what was gonna happen, but let me, I forgot to say, I knew we would be lost in this sea of mainstream toys. So I contacted the toy, the people who were in charge of the catalog, and I requested a special heading that was for toys for kids with special needs. And that was in 2006. So we were the only company under this heading. Now, of course, any toy that makes a noise or has a bump or anything is listed under this category. So it started off really slow. People didn't really understand our toys, but someone, and I was talking to Tristan about this, someone took our ribbit ball and asked if they could use it in a workshop they were doing. Well, after this workshop let out, our, our booth was flooded, flooded with so many people who wanted to learn about our toys, why we started the company, and how we came about creating these toys. So we felt just on top of the world that people were interested in our toys. Um, and after that, the company continued just focusing on toys for kids with special needs. And then I think that that's the story of the company. And I'm, I'm still with the company doing product development and Marty is going to touch on the next phase of the company, Bill and Buddy transforming into playability toys. Thank you. Okay, could you uh, advance the slide, please? Oh, this this is this was our experiment with our first logo. Oh, I'm sorry, Marty. I'm just going to explain. No, um, no, go for it, Joyce. Okay, it was actually <clears throat> since Bud was an aeronautical engineer, he's the kid holding up the airplane and Bill and Bud met through sail racing. So we had to include a boat in there. And they're two little kids. Bill and Bud were, were, like, were like kids. They were, they just loved toys and having fun. So that was our first logo for the company. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a uh, kind of a shot of a number of toys that we create, uh, which we'll be talking about now in more detail as the presentation moves on. So I'm uh, Dr. Marty Fox, and I'm the president of Playability Toys. And I'm going to talk to you about how I got connected to Playability Toys and what we've done in the 10 years since the company has been based here in Tucson, Arizona. So next slide, please. Um, let me hope, well, let's, let's do this poll question, I guess, right now. Um, so Paul, I'm not sure if you want me to read this or if you're sure, going to Sure, I've, I've, I've got it, no problem. 
All right, so we'd like to know what features are most important to you in a toy that's created for a child with special needs. And you can choose any or all of these choices, uh, sensory features, extra safety precautions, or adaptability. Uh, again, you can choose any or all of these. And also, if there's one that we should have added that we didn't, please put it in the chat. Uh, along with your other questions that you may have for Joyce or Marty. If there's something in this poll question we should have added, another category, uh, please add it in the chat. We did have another um, a question come in through the chat, Joyce and Marty, that you might be able to answer. Do you still have the little ribbit ball that vibrates? Um, we do not, uh, although we are looking at recreating that toy in a slightly different fashion. Um, what you're referring to is our mini ribbit ball, and it, it is a wonderful toy. Yeah, it was on the previous slide, Marty. It was photographed on there. Yeah. Gotcha. So in the chat, we have people who are sharing some other ideas for features that are most important for toys for children with special needs, and they include low price or affordability that they're attractive, that they have textures, uh, the ability to sanitize can be really important. Um, so thank you guys for dropping those in the chat. Those are great. I'm gonna post the handout again. I apologize, I had earlier shared the handouts uh, for um, the handouts page for our Access Academy. This is Partner Showcase. So you'll see that dropped in the chat. It's a quick link to our Partner Showcase handouts page under May, so thank you. You know, uh, I'll just add something to that question or the comment on uh, being able to sanitize or disinfect. Uh, when I mentioned we are looking at bringing the mini ribbit ball back, we are looking at bringing it back in a version that could be disinfected easily. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, that's exactly the way we're thinking. So let me uh, take over a little bit of history and tell you how we ended up in Tucson and literally how we ended up with this next product you know, on the screen, paint pot palette. So Bud, uh, as, as Joyce had indicated, was an aeronautical engineer. Uh, he literally was a rocket scientist. Mm -hmm. and much of his career traveling around the world, helping various space programs launch rockets into space. Um, he was tied in uh, very closely with the University of Arizona's aeronautical engineering and space program connected with NASA down here. Um, Tucson is a big space community, um, both from an astronomical and an aeronautical engineering perspective. Um, so Bud moved to Tucson about uh, 11, 12 years ago and wasn't quite sure whether he wanted to continue the company or just focus his time on launching or just retire. Uh, all were options at the time. Um, I met him uh, just coincidentally. My background is in healthcare administration and educational psychology. Uh, he told me what he was trying to do and he showed me the toys that he and Joyce had created. And, and I love them. And I said uh, to him that I wanted to do everything I could to help him uh, reopen the company as playability toys down here in Tucson, uh, which we did. And early on, one of the goals that Bud and I had was to connect ourselves and introduce ourselves to the special needs communities here in Tucson. Um, one of those was the School for the Deaf and Blind here. And there we had the pleasure of meeting the art teacher, uh, Don Smitty, whose quote is showing up on your screen. And she allowed us to sit in on some of her art classrooms with her uh, students that impaired. And um, we were amazed at some of the things that she was doing and the creativity that she showed in teaching, painting, coloring to her students. And one of the tools that she had created for herself was this palette of colors and an organization process. She knew exactly where the different colors were, the, the paints that were in little tiny buckets were brailed so the students could identify them. And both Bud and I were just transfixed watching the kids paint and laugh and just have such a great time. 
So we approached Don and we said, you know, we'd really like to make a commercial version of this painting kit that you've created. And that was the essence of the paint pot palette. So if you go to the next slide, uh, Nikki. Um, so this is the paint pot palette and, and we, for all intents and purposes, just created a commercial version of what Dawn had done herself. Um, she was very creative, is a very creative individual and, and an artist. And um, she did wonderful things with her children. And we wanted to be able to get that and spread the joy, so to speak, get this product out there so that more kids could enjoy what Dawn was doing with her students. Next slide, please. So let me get rid of this question. So here are some of the things that the paint pot palette includes. Um, it's printed instructions um, in braille and print, um, a tray palette, paint cups that fit into little holes, uh, braille tiles and paint brushes. So the braille tiles allow you to identify different paints uh, that you're going to use. Next slide, please. Oops, let me, let me stop before I get into the poll question, tell you a little bit more about the product. So we have instructions that tell you how to mix paints to come up with different colors. Um, so it, it's a wonderful product. Uh, we combine that with coloring sheets that are both um, highlighted uh, so that they can feel from a tactile perspective. They're embossed from a tactile perspective so you can feel the painting and they're braille to offer different suggestions for painting colors that kids can use. Um, and those, uh, what were called, uh, the art sheets were created by an artist in the San Francisco area for us. So one poll question that we have uh, related to our outreach is, have you ever associated colors with different smells? And we have given you a couple of examples of that, uh, associating smoke with, with the color black, associating grass with the color green, strawberry or cherry with the color red. You may have some others. As somebody who cannot see color myself, uh, I've had people try to describe colors with different objects like that. So do you have examples of that? Ones that you've used or have heard or uh, have, have thought about? Uh, you can always throw those in the chat as well. Maybe there's some other things that we could think of that would be objects that we could uh, associate with different colors. Paul, in the chat, people are sharing um, the idea that blueberry might associate with blue or purple. Uh, the the fruit orange with the color orange, the idea that there's hot and cool colors. Um, people sometimes describe red as fire, um, water as as blue. So you have that idea of hot and cold to include a sensory element in the description. Ooh, lemons for yellow, that tart acidity might really remind you of brightness that you get from yellow. Excellent. We have someone in the chat who had shared, um, this is from the first poll question about what is important in toys for children with special needs. Uh, someone in the chat shared toys or functional activities that can be used with upper grade level students that look grade level appropriate because in life skills classes in high school, you can't give a 19 year old an Elmo even if that's their totally favorite toy. So that uh, pointing towards uh, making toys for all ages. Excellent. All right, so thank you guys um, for participating in that in that poll question and in the chat. Uh, someone said in the in the chat, smelly felt pens do this and could be used as a guide, keeping things congruent. Yes, yeah, so matching a smell with a color in a marker. Oh, I loved those smelly markers when I was a yeah, kid. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> I still like them, but you know, I did also like them when I was a kid. <laughs> All right, we're gonna end that poll and hand it back to you, Marty. All right, next slide, please. Joyce, we're actually handing it back to you. Okay, this is one of our products that we do for APH and it's called um, the Paint by Number Safari Series. 
this item came about through discussions with my good friend, Frank, who is blind. I would babysit his animals. We go to the same church and I've just known him for years. And one day when I was driving him home, he said, oh, wouldn't it be great if there were more products that taught kids that were blind about real world colors? And I thought, interesting. So I just kept mulling that idea in my head. And I thought, well, what about paint by numbers? And working with closely with Tristan from American Printing House, we came up with the paint by number safari series. And as you can see, we started off our very first book was tropical rainforest. And then uh, under the sea, backyard creatures and desert. We, are, we just completed our fifth book in the series and that one will re be released hopefully late this year or early next year. Um, do you want me to tell what, what it is, Tristan? <laughs> Oh, Tristan, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it, that's fine because the last couple of years, whenever I went to a conference, I was polling teachers in the exhibit booth about if they would like to have the fifth book be what we finally decided it, and they all overwhelmingly wanted it. So yes, go ahead and tell them what the last book is. It's um, Enda Endangered Creatures, which is a great book. It's really amazing. The each book, they're they're large books. Um, each book contains an introduction to the series, fun facts, which in the beginning of this webinar, we did just touch on one fun fact from each of these four books. And then it has color codes. So if the child does want to follow the actual color code, it's right there for them at the end of the fun facts. In the back of the book, are 10 heavy um, pieces of paper with deep uh, embossed lines that the um, child can actually feel the images, each part of the images for, the, for painting. And then each book contains braille for all the printed words in the book. And I, I love this series because I've, I've learned so much about animals through this series. And I know kids have had a lot of fun, blind, kids that are blind. And I've, I've given this book to kids that weren't blind. They love this book and they love learning about these creatures. They're, they're so interesting. And I would love one day to do a new series in this paint by numbers um, theme, because I, I just, they're, they're one of my favorites. You go to the next slide, Nikki. Here's a few of the illustrations included in the books. Mm -hmm. So each book has the number for the color. And again, the color code is in the fun facts section. Um, and it also has braille numbers. The dotted lines indicate that it's a plant or a rock or an animal, something in the background. And the thinner lines within the animal just show that, indicate that it's within the animal. So it's not the outer part of the animal, the outline, but within. Mm -hmm. And here's some examples of actual, the books in use. And you can use crayons or paints from the paint pot palette or markers, but having the paint pot palette there where you can mix the colors is ideal. And there's and just you know, a list of- You know, Joyce, another thing is to uh, put glue in the areas and put different colored uh, glitters and textures inside um, the animals as well. Yeah, that, that would be great, yeah. We should include that in the instructions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because some of the some of the creatures are, you know, we've done butterflies, and how how beautiful that would be to spackle some um, glitter. And we the, the hummingbird. There's so many. Yeah, and one of the things I really like about the fun facts is that yes, 
the fun facts can incorporate geography, and it incorporates math just by learning. We give you both, um, you know, inches and centimeters and meters, right. uh, pounds. We give you kilograms. We but, really. Um, I I like the way we do comparisons, like the tree frog. Mm -hmm. Yes, we tell you how big that tree frog is, but we will tell you that some are so small that they will fit on the tip of your finger. So right. for a child who is visually impaired or blind, they can feel the tip of their finger and they really get an idea as to how small that, mm -hmm. that tree frog can be. Yeah, that's a good point. You know? So we love these books. <laughs> okay. I'm excited for the endangered species one. Oh, it's a great oh, yeah. book. Yeah. And we should get that out this year. I don't think you'll be waiting until next year for that. Yeah. Yeah, we just finished approving everything. Yeah. It yeah. goes back and forth so many times. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's it's amazing. But I, I've thought of other series like landmarks, interesting plants. A series. There's so many. There's so many don't, things. Don't give away the next poll question. Is, is there a poll question on that? I think I included one. There is. There is, is it, okay. Is it, is it time for it now? Mm -hmm. I think it'd be good time. I think let's do it, All yeah. right, let's do it. So um, you heard that the fifth book in the series was basically one that, that a lot of teachers said they wanted. So mm -hmm. are there any additional topics you would like to see made into a Paint by Numbers series? Joyce give, has given us a couple of options. Again, plants. Places of interest slash landmarks or insects slash creepy crawly things. But we would also really like to have you add something in the chat. So if there is something that you would like to see made into a, into a book, this is a great time to add it. And maybe there's something that we hadn't thought of. Ooh, someone said unusual foods biology, maybe using the human body um, and adapt it to different age levels, um, different jobs like police officer, firefighter, um, what street signs look like or signs that you might find in your community, stop, yield, um, those kind of signs, jungles, rivers, ooh, an underground one like on caves. How oh, exciting. yeah. Uh, household items, dolls, playground structures, holidays, Creatures of other galaxies, <laughs> space theme, sports, construction or recycling, another vote for space, family members. Great. Thank you guys for That's participating great. in that. I will, I will copy all of these. Yeah, we definitely need to save them with that playability. List. Yes. After, after the webinar. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, we did have a lot of votes in our poll. 49% voted for plants. Ooh, I would love to see a botanical garden with plants from oh, all oh. over the world. Uh, places of interest and landmarks got 57% of the votes. Uh, insects, creepy crawly things got 53% of the votes. Yeah, you'd have to pick some colorful beetles and worms and butterflies uh, to include in a creepy crawly book. Ooh, and someone in the chat says, wander through the woods. Excellent. That sounds kind of like the backyard creatures one. The creatures we'll find in our backyard like woodpeckers. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll, but feel free to put more responses in the chat if you'd like. All right, back to you guys, playability. Next slide. And back to you, Tristan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. Okay, I'm going to talk about um, the ribbit balls. And as you see here on the screen, they, they are in three sizes. The red and yellow one is 14 inches. The blue and yellow is 18 inches. And this photograph, you know, it, on my slide, it almost looks like a dark shade of blue, but it is actually a black ball with yellow ribs. Um, I, that's really odd. It depends on which way I turn my head, whether the ball is blue or black. Interesting. It is black and yellow only. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a little boy named Christopher that Joyce actually knows. 
And as you will see, the ribbit ball he is holding is three colors, not two. Well, I'm going to take you back to that International Toy Fair in New York that Joyce talked about they went to. Well, APH generally does not go to that fair. It's a very large fair and very, very expensive fair to go to. But one year, um, they sent the then director of research to the International Toy Fair. And he, he knew about the toy fair. He knew how to navigate it and everything because he actually came from the toy industry. And he came across that rivet ball. He came across two balls at that fair and he knew that I was developing APH's uh, electronic sound ball at that time. So he brought back two balls for me. One of them was the rivet ball. Well, at that time, I was also developing APH's first CVI website, and I was learning so much about CVI. And for those of you familiar with cerebral or cortical visual impairment, you know that visual complexity is a deterrent for those children to be able to, to focus and see. So, you know, if they see too much visual complexity, their brain will shut down and their brain cannot process what their eyes are seeing. So, um, we approached uh, Playability Toys at that time. I was uh, talking to, I guess, Bill and Bud, because uh, that, that was what they were operating under the time, uh, Bill and Bud Toy Company. And I asked them if they would be willing to custom make a ball just for APH, because you know if it's custom made just for APH to sell, um, we could then uh, submit it for quota eligibility. So we asked for three things to be changed on this ball and playability toys didn't bat an eye. They just did it very graciously. So all of our balls are only two colors, which is what you saw in the previous slide that cuts down on the visual complexity. Um, second is that, that original ball had a latex bladder on the inside. And because of the, the children with severe multiple disabilities that we design a lot of products for, they are medically fragile, many allergies. So APH just does not sell latex in its products. So we requested an alternative to the latex bladder and they provided us with a, I believe it's a PVC bladder. It, it kind of looks to me like a, a pure white beach ball on the inside. So that was the second accommodation they made for us. And then third, um, there is a tag, you know how all products come with a little tag that has all the little uh, testing coating on it and stuff like that. Um, I just requested that they add the words, not a therapy ball on it because we did not want this to be used as a therapy ball, particularly for children to grab a hold of it and to sit on it and bounce and jump like a physio ball or anything. Because it being a PVC bladder on the inside, we did not want anything to pop and any child to then fall to the ground and hit their head or whatever. So it was a safety precaution. So um, they added the words on that label, not a therapy ball for us. And that became the APH ribbit ball and it was approved for quota eligibility and we have been selling it ever since. So uh, next slide, please. So here is a, probably the most famous photo APH uses for everything for the ribbit ball is these two children out in a field uh, playing with the ball. And as you can tell, they look very, very happy. And one of the reasons I love this ribbit ball is because it is so lightweight that very, very young children, younger than these two, can pick it up, they can grasp it, they can hold it. Um, and this little girl can hold it up over her head. She, that little, that 18 inch ball is actually bigger than her. But um, kids even who have cerebral palsy, they can grasp just in their grip of those ribs. They can grab those ribs. And I have seen kids in wheelchairs, like kind of in a circle, and they can just grasp those ribs and they can just kind of like slide it or throw it over in a way to the child next to them in a wheelchair. And then that kid can grab a hold of the ribs. So they can actually play their own game of tossing that ball and catching that ball with each other. So um, next slide, please. So this is at the uh, first National Family Conference that APH put on at the Galt House a number of years ago. And here, um, it being a National Family Conference, it's a conference that um, 
children who are visually impaired, their entire families can come to. So their, their sighted siblings as well are there. And as you can see in this play area, the kids just enjoy playing so much with the rivet balls, stacking them, throwing them. Uh, this was actually the fair where I saw the, the children with cerebral palsy in the wheelchairs playing with them. And they can actually, in a way, play their own little like soccer game. That if, if they have any kind of a wheelchair that they can bump into the balls and the balls roll on the ground, then another kid can bump the ball with their wheelchair. So it, it it's kind of a precursor because I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but there is a power wheelchair soccer and uh, it is played across the United States, but you know, you're older and you have a power wheelchair. So uh, this is kind of like a precursor to get those kids interested in playing power wheelchair soccer. Um, next slide. And I think this is our last slide showing the rivet balls. And this is just showing this little girl being able to grasp um, these balls. And she would be able to lift that ball. I don't think of a photo of her doing it, but she can. These balls are so lightweight. Like Joyce said, when you grasp a hold of those ribs, it makes a crinkling noise. When they roll across the ground, they make that crinkling noise. Now, when you get the 14 inch ball, you can, you rely on your lungs to blow it up. And likewise with the 18 inch, the, the blue and yellow one that the little girl is holding here. Um, I can blow up that, that blue one, but um, it, it, it takes a bit of a doing. Now the larger 30 inch ball, that black and yellow ball, it comes with a foot pump. And if you do have that foot pump, you can then use it on any of the other balls as well. But um, there's an opening in the balls that have uh, it's a Velcro slit and you pull open the Velcro, you release the uh, valve on the PVC bladder and that is how you can deflate the balls and you can remove it. If your PVC bladder does spring a leak, you can purchase um, replacement balls. I know APH, uh, replacement bladders, I mean. APH, I know, still sells the 14 inch and the 18 inch. I am not sure about the 30 inch right now, but um, I don't know. Marty, do you guys still sell yeah. the 30 <laughs> We do, and, and okay. you do also. We do? Okay, I, I could not remember. Okay, great. So, yes, yeah, so you can, um, these you take the bladders out I, and you can wash these balls. I mean, water doesn't hurt them. Like I said, it's kind of like a, a beach ball on the inside in there. So yes, you can play with them in the water, uh, play with them on land, lightweight, stack them. Uh, they, they don't hurt you if they hit you. That's a great thing. But the safety feature of playing with these balls are fantastic. I mean, if you're laying on the ground and one of those balls roll over you, you'll probably just giggle. So um, I have taken these balls to multiple national family conferences. I have taken them um, down to, um, in Southern Kentucky, we have the Center for Courageous Kids. I have taken them down there. And um, we also use them here at APH once a year. We kind of celebrate the summer solstice. Uh, this year, that's going to correspond with our spirit week we're having here to welcome a lot of people back and to APH since COVID had happened. And uh, we use these rivet balls out on the front lawn of APH of people just kind of without a net or anything. We just bounce the balls like they're volleyballs um, all over the front yard. And just everyone at APH has a, a great time with them. You know, we, we set up all kinds of games out there and often we use uh, some of our products uh, for this day of activities. So it, it is a ball that um, it may have been designed for, for special needs children to play with, but um, I've never seen a kid who has 20-20 vision who did not love this ball as well. So that's pretty much all I have to say about the, the rivet balls is they're great. I love them. And I'm so glad we sent someone to the International Toy Fair that one year, because if it wasn't that one year, I'm not sure if we would have had this great relationship we've had with Playability Toys all these years. So thank you, Marty. Thank you, Joyce. And if you see Bud somewhere, tell them thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tristan. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I, I want to add one thing. Uh, and by the way, you're right. My, my grandkids love this ball. Uh, and play with it all the time, which is why I have three of them here in my house. But the back to the question about disinfecting, um, you know, with the emphasis, we actually tested the ball this year, hospital grade disinfecting wipes, and it stayed fine. So 
Excellent. I, I just saw in the chat, uh, uh, someone wrote in and says that they, uh, they kick the balls and then their students have to locate the ball using their white canes. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. that's great. Okay, next slide. Okay, I, I guess I'll read this quickly. Uh, you can add into the chat for this. Like I just said, someone just wrote in how they use their rivet ball with their students. So tell us, how would you use the rivet ball with your children or students? Just please add that into the chat. We would love to see even more ideas. Mm -hmm. And I would even say, if you've got a model release on a child and you want to take a great photo, send it in to us. We'll show it. But I, I would have to have that model release form to do that. <laughs> So while they're doing that, I'll add a little bit of one of the events that we sponsored here in Tucson a number of years ago was uh, a play day uh, with the Autism Society here. So we had a number of kids on the spectrum um, and we had a play leader who was one of the most creative teams I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And some of the things he did with the ball uh, was he said the kids play volleyball on their knees uh, with a low net. Um, he had them do relay races where they put the ball between them and they had to partner two kids keeping the ball with their chest and no hands uh, going back and forth in the relay race. And uh, it was an inspiring day for all of us looking at the creative ways that this teacher was able to uh, engage the kids. And it was important not just from a, a physical perspective or motivation, um, these were kids on the spectrum. So watching them engage socially uh, was, was extremely rewarding. Yeah, Marty, we have taken the rivet ball to OcaliCon, which is um, Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidence Conference that's held in Columbus every year. And um, they like the rivet ball there as well, yes. Great. So some of the responses that have come in in the chat are uh, using the ribbit ball during recess with their peers for peer interaction and back and forth play for APE and motor lab and gr to develop gross motor and fine motor skills. Awesome. Another one came in. Other than ball type play, this is a great tactile experience for severely impaired students to have on the tray of their chairs and just leaning into it. Tactile and auditory feedback. Actually, um, here's the ball. Here's the yeah, thank you, Marty. <laughs> 14 inch version. I don't know if you can hear this, but yep, I hear it. Rib sound. You can hear that when it's in the air, also. Okay, I guess next slide. Okay, All Marty, right. I think it's Marty. So that concludes the portion of, of our talk that focuses on portability. So I'm going to tell you a little bit briefly about a, a different brand of products that we've moved into. And, and the, the way we moved into them is somewhat interesting. I was teaching a group of child life specialists at one of our hospitals uh, about some of the toys that we had for children with special needs. And at the conclusion of the, the session with these child life specialists, I asked them, you know, what we could do for them. Um, and all of them immediately raised their hands and said, we really need a baby mobile, a crib mobile uh, that can be used in the hospital. Um, I was surprised because probably as all of you know, there are literally hundreds of mobiles uh, available uh, in the marketplace, uh, just go to Amazon. Um, but in terms of, we went through a long process, identified their needs and uh, discovered that in fact, there wasn't a mobile that met their needs from a, an infection control perspective, from a developmental perspective and from a safety feature perspective. Um, so at that point, our Nurture Smart brand was born and we started to create products that could be used by child life specialists and other clinicians in the hospital with the pediatric and nursery patients there. So we now have, next slide please. Um, we now have, well, it's next slide again. So this first is a crib mobile, which is our first Nurture Smart product. 
Um, it has a number of unique features associated with it. Um, but maybe the most important thing and the most important way it differentiates from other mobiles on the market is it's completely disinfectable. Uh, so what that means is it's made of materials that can be easily disinfected. And there's also no nooks and crannies, gaps that infections or pathogens could hide in. Uh, <clears throat> it's a, a rather intensive design and manufacturing process to get that accomplished. So what we wanted to do was create a product that could be disinfected, was built to a standard that could uh, you know, withstand um, hospital constant use, and then also include exceptional developmental features. So this includes black and white and multiple colors. Another unique feature of this is that arm that you see on the crib can be moved up and down rapidly. So in a hospital setting, uh, if you have an emergency situation, the mobile can be moved out of the way immediately uh, at no risk. Um, so we went through and go through with each of our Nurture Smart products, uh, a developmental process that we involve clinicians in. Um, and next slide, please. So our, our second product, um, and next slide, so we'll look at it as I talk about it. Uh, hospitals needed something that would work with a bassinet. Um, if you think of babies in a nursery ward, you don't see them typically in cribs. You don't see them in pack and plays. You see them in these little warmers or, or bassinets. So they needed something that could safely attach to those. So we decided to create a second mobile with a whole different attachment mechanism that could attach to virtually anything. It could attach to a crib, it could attach to a bassinet, it could attach to a pack and play. Um, and uh, the hospitals loved it. We also just coincidentally, um, I was conversing with a military family and they were talking about, um, you know, couldn't we do something for the deployed military families when a, a mom or a dad of a young child or a young baby is deployed. Um, and so we added a, a unique recording feature to this mobile. So in addition to having traditional sounds that mobiles have, lullabies, heartbeat, white noise, this one also allows a parent or a loved one to record their own voice. Um, and play it back to the baby. And we did that primarily for military families, but we found that this is a feature that grandparents and lots of other people love and hospitals love because they can record the parent's voice, particularly for a patient that's long-term or isolated. Um, so this has been uh, a very rewarding product for us in many ways. And our third product, next slide, please. And next slide is an activity gym. And so there are activity gyms available, but there are none that have the features that this one does. So again, as with all Nurture Spark products, it's easily disinfected. Uh, that's, that's one of the, uh, the highlights of the brand and something that's true to all Nurture Smart products. Um, this one again can be folded and taken down easy. Um, it includes interactive you know, response toys. Um, so uh, this is our third product, and we just put this on the market this year. And we have several more that will be coming out uh, during, um, hopefully, by the end of this year. They include a sound device that uh, actually has true in utero sounds available to it, as well as, we think, pink noise. Um, we have a different type of mirror. Um, babies are fascinated by themselves. Um, and we have um, a number of other products that are in our, our idea, so to speak, pipeline. Um, so that's our Nurture Smart line. It's obviously different from the, the toys that we do under playability, but there's also a lot of crossover between the two. Next slide. Oh, Tristan, we can't hear you. Okay, yeah, Marty, someone asked in the chat how high this, this gym thing will go. How high will that go? Oh, uh, it's about two feet. Okay. Thank you. And so the, what you're seeing there, you see the loops that hang, the toys hang from? Uh-huh. Uh, that allows you to adjust the height of the toys as they're hanging down. You can hang them higher or lower or less of those loops. Okay. Thank you. Great. And a question came in the chat. Will you have black ones for CVI students? Uh, black toys. Yes, I I think that's um, 
what this yes this we will happens. have black toys in fact we're talking about uh, a whole set of toys that could be uh, uh, marketed as a separate product that would be black and white toys right yeah uh, they clarified black stand great thank you all right and just to make sure we're all aware we've got four minutes left in this webinar um yeah, black and white or to change to red and yellow. All right, thank you for putting that in the chat. Okay. Is that the last slide? There should be another slide. Yeah, there we go. Great. All right, Paul, this is the discovery slide if you wanna wrap us Perfect. up on what we've learned today. Okay, so playability toys can be enjoyed by children of all abilities. And playtime is for everyone, and we mean everyone, and that means adults or older kids, you know, 20, 30, 40, and older can play with these toys and enjoy them. And uh, toys are effective tools for teaching life skills and promoting social engagement. And additional, additionally, educational toys can reinforce skills necessary for learning and are used to support early intervention, communication, and behavior therapies. So a lot more than just play. Uh, kids may not even realize all the things that they're learning, but they are learning quite a bit. And let's move into our last slide, which is just a way to, if you have information, or I should say, if you have questions or things that you want to share that you didn't get to share today, you can always contact uh, info at playabilitytoys.com. If you want more information on Nurture Smart, which is the last group of things that you heard about, nurturesmart.org. Uh, again, contact Joyce and Marty about future product ideas at info at playabilitytoys.com and check out the Nurture Smart uh, things there on their website. Playability's mission is to ensure that all individuals have opportunities to laugh, learn, and grow through play with creatively designed toys and games. Um, and we hope today that you got an idea that uh, there are many, many different options out there. And we just wanna thank Marty and Joyce and Tristan for sharing those with us and not just sharing the toys, but the enthusiasm as well, because uh, you know sometimes we think maybe toys aren't available and they are. Um, I'm jealous. I would have loved to have had toys like this growing up. And I just want to add, we really do love hearing input and ideas from teachers, therapists, and parents out there. Yeah, I think that that's a common theme across all of our toys, whether right. it's ability or nurture smart, is that the ideas, the concepts for these toys come from clinicians, they come from teachers, they come from therapists, they don't come from us. Yeah. We take the ideas and we try and make them a reality. And, and lots of just, thank yous. Oh, sorry, Paul. Just letting everybody know we haven't recorded it yet, but we plan to, I plan to talk with Marty and Joyce here shortly. Uh, it'll be much more brief, but on our podcast, we have segments uh we call partners with paul and i'll be talking with them and it'll be a lot more brief but introducing everybody to playability toys as well and that'll be another way for you to hear more about them and if folks didn't get to hear today's webinar uh, you'll be able to share that podcast episode probably the one coming out uh in a couple weeks on may i want to say the 22nd whatever that thursday is um, so we'll, we'll set that up. We'll talk to them and we'll get that into a podcast. Hopefully that next one, be on the lookout for that, our change makers podcast. And that'll be another opportunity for you to share playability toys, uh, with whomever you like that maybe they didn't get to hear today's webinar. Absolutely. And I dropped the link where this webinar, which was recorded, it will be put on our YouTube page for Partners Showcase. Give us about a week to get that up. We did have one question come in, Joyce. Does the Paint by Number Safari series come with the paints to use? It does not. We just recommend um, using crayons or the Paint Pot palette or even markers, whatever you have on hand. 
Great. And, and Thank I, you so much. I, I will tell you that we do that um, to kind of compartmentalize the different items because adding paints to every book that we sold would make the cost of that book go up so much. And typically, after you're done with one book, you would still have a lot of paints left over <laughs> and you would have to keep buying paints and buying paints that you don't need. So a lot of it is designed so that um, it keeps the cost of each of the books down. Because those books, I feel, are one of APH's more affordable books. I really do. Yeah. Great. Well, lots of thank yous in the chat. Um, many folks are pointing to that these are new products for them that they're excited to check out. Um, and that they can think of many different uses for these products. So again, if you've got questions or you'd like to share an idea, Marty and Joyce have left their email, info at playabilitytoys.com, open for you guys to use. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Playability. And thank you, Tristan, for joining bye us bye. today for this webinar. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.